Amen. Amen. Father God in heaven, thank you, Lord, for this day. And it is well with our soul because of the cross. It is well with our soul because of your resurrection from the dead. It is well with our soul for those of us who have you living in us. Thank you so much for that, Lord. Thank you for rescuing us, saving us, forgiving us of our sins, adopting us as your children, Lord. And Father, bringing us into your kingdom. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name I pray, Father. Amen. You may have a seat. What an amazing, amazing song. It is well with my soul. If you haven't looked up the history behind that song, you ought to. It was written by Horatio Spafford. And it's Horatio Spafford lost, lost part of his family to a, a, a ship sinking in the Atlantic. And he wrote that song after he lost family members. And he wrote, it is well with my soul because of who Christ is. Amen? Amen. Guys, y'all ready to be changed? Yeah. Hebrews 4.12 says, for the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword in the piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit of both joints and marrow. And it judges the thoughts and intents of the heart. Hebrews 4.12. So please open your Bibles this morning to Hebrews chapter 17. Now, for those who are visiting with us, we go chapter by chapter, verse by verse. We've been going through Hebrews chapter 11, but we have really slowed down. I normally do about a half a chapter a Sunday in our verse by verse study, but for the next, I don't know how long, we've been in it about five weeks, probably being in another five weeks, but we're looking at each individual hero of the faith in Hebrews chapter 11. And this morning, it brings us to part two of Sarah, Abraham's wife. So you don't have to turn there, but I'm going to read to you the verse in Hebrews that, that sends us back to Genesis, but it'll be up on the screen. That's Hebrews 11, 11. And Hebrews 11, 11 says, by faith, even Sarah herself received the ability to conceive even beyond the proper time of life, since she considered him faithful who had promised and the thing that stands out about Sarah the most is she considered him faithful. In other words, she had faith in God. She had faith in his promises. She wasn't perfect by no means, neither are you and I, but she stayed the course and she trusted in the Lord and he was faithful to her promise. Uh, what did we see last week? Last week I introduced you to Sarah and we saw that Sarah came from a pagan family, the Urichaldeans. Uh, she came from a pagan family and she had a huge stigma in her life. And what was that? She could not have children. And then we saw the, the, the conflict that she had with Hagar. And then last week we were introduced to one of the names of God in scripture. Do you remember what that was? El Rohi, or some people say El Roy. And it means the God who sees. And you need to understand that as a believer. The world needs to understand that. That God sees everything. But as a believer, as a child of God, you need to understand this morning that God sees your heart. He sees your heart and he knows exactly where you are. That was El Rohi. Well, this morning, I'm going to introduce you to a new name that some of you may know that's found in Scripture, found in Genesis chapter 17, and that is, he is El Shaddai. El Shaddai, God Almighty. They say, it is recorded that back in those ancient times, the nomadic people would be traveling across the desert, across the flatlands of the Middle East, and they would come up to a, a huge mountain, and they would look at the mountain, and they would go, Shaddai, because the mountain was so huge and so big. Also, the ancient Israelites called God El Shaddai because it reminded them of Mount Sinai. It reminded them of Mount Sinai. So here we are before Mount Sinai in uh, Genesis chapter 17, and God's going to reveal himself as El Shaddai. Now, my teaching is on Sarah, and last week we really zeroed in on Sarah. But this week, part two, we've got to bring Abraham, Abram, his name's going to be changed to Abraham, we've got to bring him into the picture because they are a couple, and they are one. And what God is doing in one, God is doing in the other. You see, Abram or Abraham and Sarah, their life centered around one thing. And that one thing was the Abrahamic covenant 
that, that God made with Abraham. And the Abrahamic covenant was three part. It was a land promise, a people promise, and a spiritual promise. The land promise was the land of Israel that we know today as, as Israel. God promised to Abraham and his descendants, the Jewish nation, that piece of land, that physical piece of land. And then the people, the people promise, at this point in scripture, uh, Israel's not in existence. There's no such thing as the Jewish nation. So God's fulfillment promise to Abraham is I'm going to bring this Jewish nation that we call Israel into existence. And then thirdly of the Abrahamic promise, it was a spiritual blessing. And that spiritual blessing is what you and I have in our laps this morning. The New Testament, the gospel of Jesus Christ. It was through the Jewish nation of Israel that Jesus came into this world through the Abrahamic covenant. But it didn't start with the gospel. It didn't start with Jesus coming into this world. It started back in Genesis with, with Abraham and Sarah. So three parts this morning. I'm going to break it down into three sections I'm going to talk about as we go through scripture. Number one, God is going to reveal who he is in the form of El Shaddai. Number two, God is going to give Abram and Sarah a new name. And number three, God, we're going to read in scripture where he fulfills his promise to Sarah and to his covenant promise, the Abrahamic covenant. So y'all ready to dig into it? Let's do it. So let's start with uh, Genesis chapter 17. In Genesis chapter 17, verse 1, God's going to reveal who he is. And what you need to understand, because we're talking about Sarah, is Genesis chapter 17 is also directed towards Sarah. Look at verse 15. Verse 15 says, I'm sorry, excuse me, chapter 17, verse, uh, verse 15, I'm sorry, that's it, Seventeen fifteen says, then God said to Abram, as for Sarah, your wife. So this passage is also being addressed from God to Abraham, but it's for Abraham and Sarah. So let's take a look at it. Genesis 17, uh, verses one and two says, now, when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. I will establish my covenant between me and you, and I will multiply you exceedingly. I want to stop right there. I want to stop right there because there's three important points that we see in verses 1 and 2 that gets highlighted about who God is and what he expects. And the first one is found in verse 1, where he says there, I am God Almighty. And the Hebrew phrase for this in the text is El Shaddai. He is El Shaddai. He is the mighty, overpowering one, meaning God will do what he purposes to do. And he will overpower all opposition that comes against his plan. How encouraging is that? That God's plan cannot be thwarted. It cannot be twisted by man. And if man tries to get in the way, God will remove him. He will push him out of the way. Why? Because there is no greater power in the universe than the Lord God Almighty. He has all power, all authority, and my friend, no one is equal to him. That's where our hearts rest. That's, where, that's what it builds our faith. That's what increases our, 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 our faith and our walk with the Lord, knowing that he is El Shaddai. He is the Lord God Almighty. We love talking about his love and his grace and his truth and his mercy, and I love talking about those things, but we also need to remember he is El Shaddai. He is the Lord God Almighty. Why does he reveal himself as El Shaddai, specifically in the text, to, to Abram and Sarah? Because God why? Because God is going to defy. He's going to defy the laws of science and reason. How old, are, how old is Abraham and Sarah? Abraham and Sarah? A hundred years old and 99 years old. They are old. But God is going to defy the laws of science and nature. And he is going to give them a child in their old age as part of the Abrahamic covenant. I love what Chuck Smith said. Chuck Smith said, man's extremities are God's opportunities, meaning you and I, us, human beings, the world, we are bound by the physical laws of nature. But guess what? God is not. 
God is not bound by the physical laws of nature. He is supernatural. That's why we believe in miracles. That's why we take the whole entire Bible literally, and we believe every miracle as it is, as recorded in Scripture. He parted the Red Sea. He took the Israelites out of Egypt. He does supernatural works because he is El Shaddai. He is the Lord God Almighty. And where our ability stops in this world is where God's ability begins in the supernatural realm to do supernatural things that defy logic, that defy reason. And we need to remember that. And we need to trust God in that way, knowing that he is El Shaddai, he is Lord God Almighty. And he can take what is impossible and it, make it possible because he can do it. Because he owns and he governs the laws of science and reason. He is El Shaddai. So that's going to be the theme as we work through this text. We're going to be thinking about God is El Shaddai. He is Lord God Almighty as we go through the rest of this text. I'll weave that in and out. The second thing he says there in verse 1, he says, walk before me. Walk before me. No, literally, live, my, live your life in my presence. You know, in other words, experience the power and the work of his Holy Spirit. You know, the Holy Spirit wants to operate in your life today. You know, he wants to operate in a supernatural way, maybe give you the gift of tongues or, or, or intercessory prayer or, or praying for miracles or doing great and mighty works for him. He wants you to experience that power. Romans chapter 14, verse 17 says, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. We have to go from studying about the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, to experiencing the Holy Spirit and experiencing his power, his joy, his presence, and trusting him to operate in a supernatural way in our lives. That's what it means to walk before him, to say, Father, here I am in your presence. Use me, Lord, as you see fit, and let me walk in the gifts and the callings that you have for me. That's what it means to walk before me to experience his power, to experience his glory, and to experience his Holy Spirit. And then the third thing he says there um, at the end of verse 1, he says, be blameless. The Hebrew word here for blameless is tamim. Tamim. When you, you hear the word that says be blameless, the first thing that, that came to my mind when I, when I read that in the text was like, oh, he's saying be holy, be perfect. But that's not what the word means. The, the, the Hebrew word to me means complete, whole, entirety. In the, in, entirety. In other words, it means uh, give God everything. This, this little thought of saying a little prayer, asking Jesus into your heart, and then going about and doing your own thing, living your own life, is not biblical. It's not biblical. God wants you to surrender everything to him. Your life your heart, your family, your marriage, your children, your career. Uh, in, in Romans chapter 10, it says, if we confess with the mouth, Jesus is Lord. When we confess that Jesus is Lord, we're saying, Jesus, you are Lord of my life. Not just Lord of my heart, Lord of my soul, but you're Lord of my everyday life. And he wants you to give him everything. Why? because he is El Shaddai. He is the Lord God Almighty, and he wants you to walk in his presence, experience the power of the Holy Spirit, experience his joy, his righteousness, his peace, and then give him everything according to verse one. And he says there in verse two, I will establish my covenant between me and you, and I will multiply you exceedingly. There he's talking about you, you're gonna, when you read Genesis and you read about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, every, every three or four verses, uh, God weaves in the Abrahamic covenant. And that's what he's talking about there in verse 2. Continuing in verse 3, this is good. This is really good. Uh, verse 3 says, Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you will be the father of a multitude of nations. There we see the Abrahamic covenant again. We've already talked about what that means. But notice verse 3. Notice when does the Lord speak to Abram? 
when he falls on his face. When he falls on his face, physically, he falls on his face. This, my friend, is, a, is, is having a, a holy reverence for God. Knowing that God is almighty, he is El Shaddai, he is holy, and we, and we respect him. We stand in holy reverence through him. We see this throughout the entire Bible, this um, falling on your face. Uh, individuals falling on their face before the Lord. Moses and Aaron fell, fell on their face before the Lord in Numbers chapter 20, verse 6. Joshua fell on his face in Joshua 7, 6. David and all of Israel fell on their face. 1 Chronicles 29, 20. Ezekiel fell on his face. Ezekiel 1, 28. Ruth fell on her face. Uh, in Ruth chapter 2, verse 10, Ezra did the same in Nehemiah uh, chapter 8, verse 6. I'm going to keep on here. Daniel fell on his face, chapter 8, verse 17. The three wise men in Matthew chapter 2, they fell on their face before the Lord. Peter, James, and John, Matthew chapter 17, fell on their face before the Lord. At what? Matthew chapter 17, the Mount of Configuration. And then you read the book of Revelations, uh, Revelation Chapter 1, verse 17, John the Apostle, when he turns to see the Lord Jesus Christ, what does he do? He falls on his face. i got to ask you all the question this morning. Have you fallen on your face? Have you fallen on your face before the Lord in holy reverence and saying, you are Lord God Almighty. You are El Shaddai. And attribute that title to Jesus not just to the Lord God Almighty, God the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and not just the God the Father, and yes, he is, he is El Shaddai, but also the Lord Jesus Christ is El Shaddai. Falling on your face means you understand how awesome God is. And yes, there are times in our life, in our prayer closet, at home, in, in, that, in that secret place where you're spending time with the Lord, that maybe you need to physically get prostrate before the Lord and humble yourself and ask the Lord to do a great and mighty work in your heart. That's what it means to fall on your face. And that's what Abram does. Now we're going to see right here, Abram fell on his face in holy submission. Later on, he's going to fall on his face in laughter. But we'll get there in a minute. But we need to be able to fall on our face. This, my friend, is the believer that God uses the three things that we just talked about. The, 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 the individual believer that falls on his face in the presence of El Shaddai and realizes how awesome God is. This is the type of believer that is blameless. That, that he is, he is tamim, the Hebrew word. He completely, wholly, and entirely gives his life and everything in it to Christ. And then also the believer that says, Lord, I want to walk before you. I want to live in your presence. That's the kind of, that's, that's the Christian I want to be. And I hope and I pray that's the Christian that you want to be. That's, the, that's, that's your heart's desire. You may not be completely there. You may have some rough edges. You may have some, some difficulties and things to work through. But if you're deep in your heart, that's, if that's the place you want to be, God will take you there. All you got to do is say, Lord, lead me, guide me, and show me the way to humbly get before you and, and to walk blameless, to walk, to walk to me, and to live in his presence. So that is where God reveals himself as El Shaddai. And that, and that means God Almighty. We like to say with the, uh, with the, the, the Greek word kurios, Lord God Almighty, this, this used in the New Testament. So now what we're going to look at is God is going to give Abram and Sarah a new name. He's going he's to change their name. Have you ever had your name changed? Anybody ever had their name changed? I have. I got adopted in 1980. I got adopted in 1980. I, I came into this world the first 10 years. I was not David Ford. I was David Baker. I was David Baker living in Augusta, Georgia. And then my father adopted me in 1980, and my name became David Ford. I took on a whole new identity. I took on a whole new life. I was no longer a baker, but now I was a Ford, living in a different household, 
being, being raised by a loving uh, stepfather and mother, but I took on a whole new identity. So when you take on a new name, there's a new identity. It's a new life. It's, it's a new way of doing things. And I, had, and I had to learn them really quickly, you know, because my father was, he was a disciplinarian and he would let me have it. <laughs> so I learned real quick, there's a new way of doing things. But, uh, but yeah, I was adopted in 1980 and I received a new name. So now let's look at the text and see Abram and Sarai's new name. And Genesis chapter 17, verses five and six, give us the account of Abram. And then Genesis chapter 17, verses 15 and 16, give us the account of Sarai. So let's check it out. Genesis 17, verse five says, no longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful and I will make nations of you and kings will come forth from you. Remember I told you I'm having to include Abraham in the story because at this point in their life, Abraham and Sarah are together as a husband and wife. And then in Genesis chapter 17, verses 15 and 16, it says, uh, then God said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her. And indeed, I will give you a son by her. Then I will bless her as she shall be a mother of nations. Kings and peoples will come from her. Do you see the calling? First off, let me just talk about this. We talk about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and the Abrahamic covenant. The Abrahamic covenant is named after Abraham. But do you see how, first off, how Sarah is intricately involved in this covenant? He's given this, he's, he's saying the almost exact same thing to Sarah that he said to Abram here in these two passages of scripture. Abram is being changed to Abraham, which means the father of many nations. And Sarah is being changed to Sarah, the mother of nations. Both uh, words, Sarai and Sarah, both mean princess. But verses 15 and 16 specifically lay out that now, she is the mother of nations. And the first question I have to ask, which I kind of alluded to it a little bit, talking about, talking about my name change, which is the question is, why a new name? Why, why, did, why did God have to change their name? Why couldn't he have just left it the same? God, why you got to come in and stir everything up and change things up? Why? Why the new name? Well, we see this throughout scripture. We see lots of people in the Bible who have names changed. Jacob, which is Isaac's son, his name will be changed to Israel. New Testament, whose names were changed? Peter. Peter. What was his name before it was Peter? Simon. And how about our our hero, our hero that wrote most of the New Testament? Paul. Paul. What was his name? Saul. So we see uh, there's a lot more. I, I Actually, I went through and counted them all. There's actually about, there's, there's about, 15 to 18 name changes in the Bible. But, but, but it made me ask the question, God, God, why do, you have to change, why do you have to change the names? I want to give you three reasons why I believe God has to change their name. And by the way, our, our, our name might not be changed. In other words, David Ford is David Ford, and he was David Ford before he was a Christian, and he's David Ford after he's a Christian. But there is a new name I do have, and it's the same name that you have that if you're a believer in Christ Jesus, and that's a Christian. You're, you're, you are a believer in Christ. You're a Christian. That word Christian, you're a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. But why a new name? Number one, talking about um, God adopting, God being El Shaddai, God adopting us, keep those Keep the framework that we've been talking about in mind as, as I give you these answers. The first reason for adoption and a new name, excuse me, not adoption, but a new name, is it reflects God's special love for his adopted children. Do you know that there's no greater act of love in this world than the act of adoption? When a parent takes a child that was not theirs biologically and brings them into the family that, in my book, is the greatest act of human love. A child that had no family 
or maybe it was abandoned or, or maybe they, they, they lost their parents or whatever. But to bring them into that family and welcome them into the family is the greatest act of love on planet Earth when it comes to human beings. God has adopted you and I and brought us into the family. And that, that name change that they experienced in the scripture, that name change that we take on, Christians, it, it, it reflects God's special love for us as his adopted children. Secondly, um, second reason for a name change, it gives us the security of saying, I belong to Jesus. I belong to the Lord. When you tell someone, I am a Christian, you're, you're giving them more than just a title, more than just a name. You're, when, you say, when you tell someone, I am a Christian, you're saying, I am a believer in Jesus. He has my heart. I am living for him. That is the type of identity that we have. That is the, I'm a, there's, there's, a, there's a Bible verse that talks about a name change for you and I. We'll get there in a minute. But that's the name that we have when we say that we are a Christian. It's, it's that security of belonging to the Lord is the second reason why you're given a new name. The third and final reason for um, Abram and Sarai given these new names is because they have a new mission. They have a new identity. You know, God is calling them and not only is he calling them, but he's equipping them and he's giving them a new name for a new identity, for a new mission. The old way of life is gone. The new way has come. They've left the Ur of Chaldeans. They traveled up to Haran. They came down the, uh, the Mediterranean coast. They came into Canaan. They went to Egypt. They came back up. And, and now he's revealing that they have a new mission. And that new mission, as we talked about at the beginning of the message, it centers around the Abrahamic covenant. God is going to use this husband and this wife to bring the nation of Israel into existence. That Bible verse that talks about you, possibly, you receiving a new name, me receiving a new name, um, in the future is found in Revelation chapter 2, verse 17, where the, scripture says, where the scripture says, whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give some of the hidden manna. I will also give that person a white stone and a new name written on it, known only to the one who receives it. I'm not going to elaborate on that because the scripture doesn't elaborate on it. But we're, we're told in eternity that there will be a new name. But you receive that, that, that overarching name now here in this life. It is called being a Christian. Being a Christian means you believe in Jesus and you've been born again. Being a Christian means you believe the Bible, you trust the Bible. And, the, and being a Christian means that you, your life centers around the Lordship of Jesus Christ and trusting in him. And uh, also notice the promise. Look back at chapter, chapter 17, verse 16. He's, uh, the Lord says, I will bless her. And indeed, I will give you a son by her. Then I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people will come from her. What was his name? El Shaddai, Lord God Almighty. God's going to use this 100-year-old man and his 99-year-old wife to do a supernatural thing, bring a baby into the world to carry on the Abrahamic covenant to its fulfillment, being El Shaddai. Look at Abraham's response, Genesis chapter 17, uh, verse 17, continue next verse. says, then Abraham fell on his face. Boy, Abraham, he loves to stay on his face. That's a good thing, though. That's a good place to be, staying on your face before the Lord. But it says, then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said in his heart, will a child be born? to a man 100 years old, and will Sarah, who was 90 years old, excuse me, I said 99 a while ago, who was 90 years old, bear a child? This is not doubt. I do not believe this is doubt that he's experiencing here. This is joy. 
This is joy. This is excitement. He's overwhelmed at the promises of God. And he's so overwhelmed, his heart is pulsating in joy that I believe the next statement that we're fixing to read indicates this, that his mind has not caught up with his heart. But it's going to. But he's overwhelmed in joy. In verse 18, he says, And Abraham said to God, over elated in joy, he says, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. But God very quickly, on the spot, says in verse 19, No, but Sarah, your wife, your wife, your older wife, will bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. And I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant for his descendants after him. As for Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I will bless him and I will make him fruitful and will multiply him exceedingly. He shall become the father of 12 princes and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant, the Abrahamic covenant, we talked about that gets weaved in and out of the story throughout the uh, Genesis. He says, I will establish with Isaac whom Sarah will bear to you at this season next year. So the promise is, Sarah, you will have a child, not Ishmael. Why? Because Ishmael came from the flesh. Okay? That's the, that's the, that's the key to understanding Isaac and Ishmael, is understanding that Ishmael came from the flesh. Isaac comes from who? The promise, the Lord. He comes, he, he comes from the Lord God Almighty. He comes from the one that is called El Shaddai. See, back before this, they took matters in their own hands. They took matter. Remember what Sarah said? I can't have a child, Abraham. Abram, you go, go into my maidservant Hagar. And they had a child. But that was done by the flesh. That was done by the flesh. But Isaac, he is coming by the promise of God. He is coming by the promises of the Lord God Almighty, El Shaddai. Here's the deal, guys. The overarching truth of Genesis chapter 17 is this. Please listen carefully. It's so easy to say we believe God for things we see. You know, we see things... We're like, praise the Lord, glory to God, he's provided, we have it, and it causes us to rejoice, and it causes us to be thankful, and we give credit, we give God all the credit and all the glory, and we should, but how about the things we cannot see? How about the things that we don't physically have? How about the unseen future? This is where the unseen future, the things that we can't see, this is where your faith meets the promises of God. And on a very practical level, you trust in the Lord God Almighty, El Shaddai. You trust in his goodness, you trust in his provision, you trust in his power. And you, we say, Lord, you know us best, and we know, because you are the Lord God Almighty, El Shaddai, that you will provide for everything, and you will take care of the future. And because of that, your heart rests your heart rests in peace, and you give thanks for the Lord, even for the things future, even for the things that are unseen. Don't try to take matters into your own hand, like, like Sarah did with Hagar, Hagar and then had Ishmael. Trust in the Lord. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. Now, we pray, we trust in the Lord, and we say, Lord, we give you complete control of this. But then you need to be listening. You need to be listening because if the Holy Spirit tells you, you need to move. You need to do things. But let him, let El Shaddai orchestrate and put things together. And not in our carnal flesh. Because how many of y'all know, we mess it up. But God is perfect. God is perfect in all his ways. And we need to trust him as El Shaddai for the unseen future, for the things that we cannot see, and give him thanks for the things that we can see, for the provision he does bring in our life. But for those things that we have no control of, you know, jobs, family, um, 
sicknesses, uh, things that we have no, we can't, we, we can't physically change ourselves. We need to trust the Lord in those areas of our life and let him be God, which is El Shaddai, the Lord God Almighty. Finally, let's look this morning how God fulfills his promises. Turn over in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 21. Genesis 21, this will be our final text for the morning. And we're looking at Genesis 21, verses 1 through 8. And again, God made a promise to Abraham and Sarah that Sarah will have a child. And in God's sovereignty, in God's providence, in his supernatural way, the Lord God Almighty, El Shaddai, is going to provide for them a child. Let's check it out. Genesis chapter 21, verse 1. Then the Lord took note of Sarah, as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah as he had promised. So Sarah conceived and bore a son to Abraham in his old age, at the appointed time by which God had spoken to him. Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him, whom Sarah bore to him, Isaac. Then Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old, as God had commanded him. Now, Abraham was 100 years old when his son Isaac was born to him. Sarah said, God has made laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh with me. And she said, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. The child grew and was weaned, and Abraham made a great feast on the day that Isaac had weaned him. First off, I want you to look at verse 1. In the NASB translation of, of, of the Bible, says the Lord took note of Sarah. Some of your translations will say um, he attended her, he visited her, he showed her grace. But the point is, God came to Sarah and he visited her. He attended her. Now, that word attended me is like he came and he ministered to her. He showed her grace. He took, God saw her response of faith in where she was in life and he comes to her and he makes it to where she can have a child. He's, he's El Shaddai. The, the Lord, and then also um, it, gives her, it gives her a child. And then notice down at verse six, it says, Sarah said, God has made laughter for me. That's a huge statement. When you consider all the things that Sarah went through, there's actually two confrontations that Sarah has with Hagar. And we, we looked at one of them last week. We didn't look at the other one. But she had a very rough going from when she told um, Abraham, Abraham to, to go into Hagar and to have a child. And that, that, that produced and caused a conflict. Later on in her life, uh, she will see uh, Ishmael as he's older, scholars believe between 13 and 14 years old. And she will get frustrated and send uh, him and Hagar away. But it was very difficult for Sarah mentally and emotionally for everything she had gone through. It wasn't an easy path that Sarah goes through. And when it, so when it says in verse six that God has made laughter to me, El Shaddai, the Lord God Almighty, is turning Sarah's pain into joy. He's turning her pain, what, what, what hurt her the most, now, she has, now she, God has brought her joy in having a child. The very first passage that introduces us to her um, in the text says that she was barren and she was unable to have child. The scripture makes it very clear that that was very uh, much of a stigma in her life. But he turns her pain into joy. He turns her sorrow into gladness. She was down and now she's happy and she's rejoicing and she's praising the Lord. He, he turns her, um, her doubt into faith. You know, sometimes Christians doubt. Sometimes Christians say, well, I don't know, maybe, coulda, shoulda. And we have those momentary lapses, those momentary uh, lapses of faith, and we have doubt. 
And what does God do in those situations? He encourages us. He encourages us by a brother or sister coming to us, encouraging us. He encourages us by the scriptures. He encourages us by going to the church. Or he just supernaturally encourages us by the Holy Spirit and tells us to lift up our heads and to have faith. We all go through doubt sometimes. And no doubt Sarah did, but now she's walking in faith and she's walking in joy. And you gotta understand, God here in granting a child to Sarah, Isaac, he is fulfilling his promise, not only to them, but to the whole entire world. Do you understand what, what, what hinges here? Your Bible that you're holding in your hands right now came through us from the descendants of Isaac. It was um, through Isaac came Jacob. Jacob, uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Jacob was renamed Israel. And, and through uh, Jacob, we were given the, uh, the 12 tribes of Israel. Through Moses, we're given the, the Ten Commandments. And the gospel that we have came through this promise. This promise fulfilled of Isaac being born to Sarah. As we close up this final week of Sarah, and I imagine we'll move on to Isaac next week as our next hero of the faith in Hebrews chapter 11. I have to ask the question this morning as, as we part ways with these, these passages on Sarah. What do we learn from Sarah? What, what did we learn last week? Remember what we learned last week in the passages we studied? He is El Rohi. He is the God who sees. And this week, we learn that he is El Shaddai. He is the Lord God Almighty that is not bound by the laws of nature and science and reason because he owns those. He is a supernatural God that, will, that can perform as he pleases. He is El Shaddai. And because he is El Shaddai, you can trust him. You can trust him with your life. You can trust him with your children. You can trust him with your future. You can trust him to provide a way for your, for your job, for your employment. You can trust him in everything in life. He's the one. What, what keeps this universe in motion? What keeps this, the, the earth spinning and orbiting the sun? God, almighty God. And that almighty God is not only God the Father, and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit, but is the Lord Jesus Christ and we can trust him with all of our lives. The second thing we learn from Sarah is you and I have to learn how to live by faith. And I will stand on the front of the line and say, man, I've got so much room for improvement. I've got so much room for improvement. Pastor David wants to trust in what he sees. He wants to trust in what he sees. He wants to wait till it's visible and he sees it to work with it. But we have to, we have to, we have to, we have to learn to live by faith for in every area of our life, not only for our family and for our job, but in every area as we trust in the Lord and we live out this Christian life, we've got to learn the art of living by faith. Scripture says in, in the book of Romans, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. What you're doing this morning as we study in God's word is you're building your faith and you're learning how to walk by faith. You know, it's like you, you read the promises of scripture, you know, the, the, the hope of, et, of eternity, the promise of eternity and of heaven, and it gives our hearts great joy. But it, it, it goes, it's, it's even more than eternity, but it's also in this life that we have to live by faith and not to put our eyes on, on what is seen. Man, this world can, it ch is changing so quickly and so rapidly. The political climate is, is, is ridiculous. The social climate, the social media, and all this, this craziness that's going on. And what it does is everything that we're going on right now, it wants to suck faith out of us. It wants, it wants you to take your eyes off the Lord and put your eyes on the situation that's taking place in this world. And God is reminding us this morning through our study that take your eyes off of what you see and put your eyes on what is unseen. And that is the eternal kingdom of God. 
Paul said in, in, in Timothy, he says, who alone is immortal, who dwells in unapproachable light, who no man has seen or can see, to him be the glory throughout all generations. Our hearts and our minds need to be filled with faith as we live this life and not on what is seen. And finally, finally, the third thing that, that as I was studying this week that I made note of that we can learn from Sarah is this. Find your identity in Christ Jesus. Find, yeah, your, your name is, is Irene Ford, Rick Howell, but your true identity of who you are is in Christ Jesus. Is it, it is in your faith, in your trust, and in your love for him. He is dwelling on the inside of you. And I like to say, you know, he's given us all a name in this room, and that name is the same, and that's Christian, followers of Jesus. You have that unique name, that you, that you are a follower of Christ Jesus. And having that new identity, as we talked about earlier, you've been adopted. You've been adopted. Just like Harold Ford adopted me in 1980, brought me up from Augusta, Georgia, and we lived over in West Columbia, lived out in Gaston for 10 years. You know, he, he, God has brought us out of darkness into his kingdom, and he's given us this new name, this new identity. Romans chapter 8, verse 15 says, For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, to the things of this world, to, to death and to darkness. You haven't received that spirit. But the, the word of God says in, in Romans 8, 15, you have received the spirit of adoption by which we cry out, Abba, Father. I love that phrase, Abba, Father. That phrase, Abba, Father, that we call God, yes, he is El Shaddai. He is Lord God Almighty. And we should fall on our faces in reverence and worship to him. But at the same time that he is El Shaddai, the Bible says he's Abba Father, Daddy. He's Abba Father. That, that's, that, that, that word Abba Father is a term of endearment. It's a term of endearment that God, you are so great and you are so awesome you've adopted me and you've brought me into your family. It's a lot like how I felt towards Harold, which I don't call him Harold, I call him dad. It's a lot like I felt towards him in 1980 when he adopted me. And, and um, I'll never forget, we were going down the road one day and um, I, I, just the first couple of days I called him Harold. And then I think we were going to Florida. And then um, one day we were going down the road and I said, hey dad, can we stop and get a drink? He about wrecked. <laughs> he about went off the road when he heard me call him dad because he had brought me into his family. I had a new dad, a new father. You have a new dad, a new father, a spiritual father who's enthroned in heaven above. And his name is the Lord God Almighty El Shaddai who's also known as Abba, Father. Which again, it speaks deeply of the relational aspect of who God is. So yes, we, we, we stand in reverence of the Lord. Uh, just want to drive this home for a second. We, we stand in reverence. We stand in awe. He is a great and majestic God and awesome in power. And at the same time, just as he was to Sarah in this passage, which I believe, she, I believe she's experiencing this aspect of God when, when she's experienced all this joy, she's experienced the Abba Father. Amen? Amen? If you're here this morning and you don't know God as Abba Father, it's because you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, the Father is not Abba Father. He invites you into a personal relationship with him. He invites you to receive him as your Lord and Savior. If you're here this morning and you're not a believer, salvation is, I, call, I like to say, it's like a coin with two sides. And it's simple. Not easy, but it's simple. And it's, you repent. You say, God, I'm sorry for my sin. Please forgive me of breaking your laws. That's one side of the coin. It's repentance. It's saying, God, I'm sorry for my sin. Please forgive me. And the other side of the coin is, is faith in Christ Jesus. You put your faith 
in the Lord Jesus Christ. You say, Lord, I'm no longer trusting in myself, but I'm trusting in you as my Lord and my Savior. If you have not done that yet, what are you waiting on, man? Uh, what, what, what's holding you back? This is the greatest experience on planet Earth, being a Christian and trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to encourage you, if you haven't become a Christian, we're going to have some prayer ministry at the close of service. I want to encourage you, if you're not a believer, take this opportunity to come up front and see one of the elders and say, I need to give my life to Christ. I need to surrender my life to him. Amen? And then also on top of that, if you're here and you're going through a difficult situation, you need special prayer. Please take advantage of, of the prayer ministry after our final song. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father God in heaven, thank you, Lord, for this day. Father, thank you for uh, the study in Hebrews and Genesis chapter 17. You are the Lord God Almighty. You are El Shaddai. And Father, we stand in reverence of you. Lord, uh, you are the great I am. You are the creator of the universe. And Lord, thank you that you are El Shaddai, the Lord God Almighty. You are Shaddai. You are great and you are mighty like the mightiest mountain that, that, that we come to, Lord God. And Father, thank you at the same time. You are Abba Father and you invite us into a personal relationship with you through your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, do your work by your spirit in our lives and our hearts and let us go out of here knowing that truly Jesus is you are Lord God Almighty. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.